Best get started again. So, in the previous lecture, we just looked at the difference between sequential and integrated product development um, and looked at the three key disciplines. Now, we're going to go a bit more in detail into this book and look at the model for integrated product development and also map it onto a real product development case so you can see how it may be used or may be able to be mapped onto a real design case. So again, just to recap, those are the three key disciplines. And it can be broken down into more detail into these different stages of uh, integrated product development model. So if you've seen uh, some of the models we introduced in the very first lecture on, um, on product development, you'll see typical phases like these of a stage gate process. So typically, this will be a stage, and then there'll be a gate after this a stage and another gate, a stage and a gate, and so on and so on. And each of those gates, you have to make a decision. Well, you can do exactly the same with the integrated product development process, but there's certain stages you'll have at the three key disciplines. So just to quickly have a look at those, in the investigation of need phase, we may have determined the basic market need, determine the type of product you're looking at, and the consideration of the process uh, for production. Um, I guess most of you are still in this phase for your business and product development. Um, and note that you could have started here, you could have started here, or you could have started here. I think most of you started at either of these two points. Then you move on to the product principle phase where you do a user investigation, design the product principle, and design the type of production system you're going to use. Then you do a market investigation, primary product design, and determine the product principles in the product design phase. And I think this is the type of phase you'll end your project at. So you'll be here with a plan to move in this direction. Uh, then you go on to production uh, preparation phase and the execution phase. So what's the purposes of the IPD model? Uh, well, the IPD model will help you understand integrated product development, help you interpret the process of new product development projects as well as past projects. What you can use it for is a checklist. So as you're developing through, you can make sure you can go back to your list and just check whether you're up to date on the three key disciplines. So maybe you're pushing ahead on one of the disciplines far too much and lagging behind on the other ones. And its limitations are it won't really tell you what to do next. It doesn't really give you that level of insight. So you can't follow it directly. You can just say, well, maybe I haven't done some of these phases yet. But most importantly is to give you uh, an integrated product development mindset to make sure you make all these considerations in an integrated fashion at the same time rather than just in sequence. So what I'm going to do is give you a case of a, a product I was developing. Um, and as a way of um, kind of giving this case to you, I'm just going to provide you with the product brief. So this is the actual documentation from the project which I was working on. Uh, the slides with the green titles will be the actual project brief documents. Um, now, this goes on for probably about 20 minutes. So uh, just put your hand up, break. Uh, break my rhythm, ask me questions, whatever you like, or you can save your questions to the end, I don't mind. So just to set the scene, the company I was working with was Crown Packaging, and these are a metals uh, packaging firm, so they produce most of the kind of Coke and beer cans uh, you'll see in the world. Um, and that in itself uh, gives some limitations of what their product range is going to be. They specialize in metals manufa package manufacturing. So therefore, some of their products won't be, uh, well, they'll be limited in scope. They're starting with a production method, and they're starting with a production material. So most of the time, their products that they propose won't be plastics or in any other material because it's not their core business. So they start very much at the bottom stage with the production side. And they have various different market segments, but the one I was working with was the metal closures. So you can see things like jam jars, bottle tops, and so on. And these are really heavily mass-produced goods. Um, and you can think sometimes think that these are in insignificant products, 
but when you think the world market for coat hangers is actually bigger than the world market for turbojet engines, you realise how important some of these things are. Uh, shaving a, a, a micron off a, of a, a sorry, mi milligram off a can is big business to these companies. Um, and they have huge product development teams working on those uh, types of things. So this is the project, Project Drizzle. Um, thanks to Crown Packaging for letting us use this. And you start off your, um, your project with a, a project brief or a mission statement. So for me, it was to follow... Um, oop. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. So that's not the mission statement, uh, but this is what I'm expecting you to do. Uh, follow the integrated product development process through the brief. So just look at the, uh, the IPD model and think how it relates to some of the slides I'm putting up. Oh yeah, there's the mission statement, sorry. Uh, so one of the th first things we do in this type of project, we put together uh, team members. So we have uh, a team from the closures business who have relationships with the uh, closures market. Um, and then we have an innovation team who are the product developers in the innovation department. The mission statement for the project was to produce an add-on component to enable a drizzle pouring function. Um, so the idea was at the moment we just produced these metal caps for bottles, um, but obviously some of the market share was getting taken over by some of the competitors producing plastic caps or aluminium caps. So the idea was to try beat them on functionality by providing this pouring function. So the competitive advantage would be uh, shape and functional differentiation from the current product range. Um, and we'd aim at uh, things such as salad dressing, marinade sauces, honey, maple syrup, and so on. So you may have noticed in soy sauce, in balsamic vinegar, in oil, you already have one of these integrated pourers. Um, and they have a metal rolled cap. So similar to if you have a, a, a screw cap wine bottle, what actually happens is the aluminium cap gets placed on the bottle on top of the glass thread. Uh, then uh, some circular cutting blades come over the top and score in uh, the thread into the aluminium cap. So the, the cap starts as a shell and then these uh, blades score the thread onto the cap when it's on the bottle. The metal caps work slightly differently. They have uh, small lugs in, um, so they, the thread is created on the caps already, and then they are positioned and screwed onto the glass bottles. So at the competitive advantage phase uh, of the brief, we were already dealt with what type of product it was going to be, and we're looking at the types of market we're going to um, try cater for. We have a project approval form. They have a, a large project number because they, they run hundreds of projects per year. Um, again, some key people within the team. This is one that I was project leader on. Then they set a series of uh, objectives. So I, I've uh, sanitized this a little bit to take out their main customers, but you may know companies such as Kraft and Nestle, and these were the types of companies that they were aiming towards. So there's high interest elicited from customers such as Kraft and Nestle uh, for an integrated pourer for packs using metal closures. Um, and it would allow them to offer more functionality while keeping their current capping facilities. So these were products that we already provide a bottle for, there's already a metal cap for. They want to produce this extra functionality without changing their production facilities at all. So they want to keep the current uh, packing lines. Uh, so this statement here is referring to the types of production system. So here's some of the existing pourers on the market. This is looking at the, uh, how to differentiate our product and where our product fits within the market range. And here's some of the market info. Um, so we're looking at these types of products, we're looking at glass bottles. So this is uh, now the constraints on the product development process. We have to fit with these glass bottles and we have to use these types of metal caps. Uh, we look at the 
where the market is located, its supermarkets, and also start to look at the market size. How many of these are going to be produced per year? This is a, a diagram of the type of cap we're going to be using. Um, so you can see here, it's a circular cap, and then there's a small lug underneath here which engages with a thread. And the idea uh, given by the marketing department was we have a 30 millimeter cap, which is quite low and sits in the bottle like this. And there's a thread. But we also have a deep cap, and the deep cap looks more like this. And that fits a deep bottle. But the idea was we'd use a, a shallow bottle with a deep cap. And that would give us this headroom here to perhaps position some kind of pouring device or product. So we're still fitting within the original production. Doesn't, we don't have to change the specifications of these uh, screw-on caps, and we don't have to change the specifications of the bottle, but we can add an extra component with, which fits somewhere in here, perhaps, that allows this drizzle function. So the target market is X million per annum. Again, I've sanitized it slightly. Um, looking at plastic injection molding in a glass product. So now the production system is set. So at the brief stage, they're saying how the, uh, this product will be produced. Uh, the additional cost, which is putting a, a limit on the market, saying what is it worth to the customers? And they say XX per thousand produced per year increase, which worked out about a 30 to 40% increase. So what that means is at the moment we sell the companies a metal cap, but for an extra 30 to 40%, we'll sell them an extra cap, which has the drizzle function. And the marketing department said, that is essentially what this drizzling function is worth to the market. Then they had two target launch dates. So a short term project, of six to eight months. In other words, we want to get this product rolled out in six to eight months. Um, and then a few years for a, a longer solution, which has a bit more longevity to it. This is one of the most important parts of a um, brief, a project brief, the musts and desirables. Um, I don't know what you've been uh, told these, these titles are previously, but we have a list of desirables and a list of musts. Now the musts are the things that the product must do. If it doesn't do any of these, it's considered a failure, it doesn't go through the stage gate and it's stopped. The desirables are the things that it would be useful if the product achieved or did. Now, if we look at this, there's some musts such as unique, give brand differentiation and a premium look, um, which relate very much to the market side of integrated product development. Thrown into the same list, you'll have things such as drip-free pouring and able to hold the low vacuum. So the product uh, needs to hold a vacuum because the lid has tamper evidence in it. There's a, I don't know if you've seen, but some of the caps have a little button on the top. And when you open it, the button pops up. And the reason it pops up is because a vacuum is released. Well, whatever solution we have, it needs to hold this vacuum. So that's relating to the design or the product level requirements. And then the production level requirements, we have suits the existing capping line with minimal changes um, and suits hot filling. So the product needs to be able to be filled while it's hot. Then we have a list of desirables. And at this stage now, we're up to here on the integrated product development process. Go ahead. Uh, they're tainting to the product, um, I believe. So when, for example, some, um, some plastics may be toxic or when they're heated may give off certain odours um, and that basically can damage the product inside the bottle. You know, you don't want to be able to taste the plastic um, and that's what those, these are types, uh, organocleptic and scalping are types of... Uh, uh, tainting of the product. A 
Okay, so we have a project plan, which is, consists of an ideas phase uh, to produce the brief, which I've just shown you now. Do some basic research, then you brainstorm a load of ideas, then you create the ideas and have some ideas about the production systems. Then you have a review meeting and a gate. And at the gate meeting, we're looking at uh, about 12 different, quite well drawn up concepts to select maybe three from to take forward to further development. And I'll go through those in a minute. Then you move on to the concept phase. And as we can see from the concept phase, we'll be looking at this area of uh, the integrated product development process. So some more CAD design, FME, uh, FEA models and trials, uh, consumer sales research, manufacturing routes and costs. Um, and then we have another gate where we'll select just one concept to go through. Then a feasibility phase, which is looking at this area here, pilot tooling, tooling inter inter uh, iterations, working prototype and so on. And then finally a development phase where you'll actually be producing it um, and launch the product. So that's a typical product brief from this company. So at the, the interface between the innovation department, the business area and the marketing department, will set all of these criteria for a project. So at the moment, you're still doing that for your projects. You're still setting this brief phrase. You need to set your musts and your desirables at some point soon to decide what your product is actually going to achieve. Um, so here are some of the concepts we came up with. Well, some of the rejected solutions that have already existed are these plastic components here, which sit flush to the bottle um, and are just far too messy. This is for syrup and you can see all of the product all around the glass is not really a useful solution for the consumer. Um, and also some of these solutions which are, are, far too, um, are far too expensive and they're difficult to put onto the product and produce. And also this one was considered a, a, a rival product but again still too expensive. So at the beginning, uh, just in case you didn't, didn't get this part, this company sells metal caps. Now, the, the design we're coming up with is a plastic insert. Now, we actually have to get somebody else to produce this plastic insert. But by doing that, we can ensure that we can continue selling these metal caps. So if this plastic insert, which adds functionality, can allow us to keep a hold of a certain market and keep selling these metal caps, it was worthwhile doing. So we did the design, we did the consumer research, but we didn't actually do the production of the inserts. We just do the production of the caps. Here was one of the first uh, concepts we came up with. And as you can see, here's the glass bottle inside. Here's a plastic insert which we, we designed, which is press fit into the bottle uh, with a non-drip lip. Um, and then you have a channeled aperture here and the uh, metal cap fits over the top of it. Here's one with a uh, similar design but with a central spout and then uh, vents in the side to allow some of the product which is dripped out to allow uh, to be vented back into the bottle. And then we did some more research into the, the production facilities and realised there were several areas where we could make an impact. Now, if I take this as an example, there's a glass bottle that comes into the, the filling lines and a nozzle goes into this glass bottle, fills it up with maple syrup, uh, marinades, whatever. It then carries on going. It's quite often steam cleaned. So a vacuum is produced by uh, flushing the top with steam kills all the germs, and then the cap comes down, hits in place, and then uh, side plates screw the cap on. So the idea was somewhere between the bottle being filled, it would then be diverted onto a different capping line, it would push the in plastic insert in, it would go back onto the original capping line, and then the lid would go on top of the plastic insert. But then we thought, okay, what if we could 
produce the bottles with the plastic insert already in it, then we don't have to disrupt their packing line at all. So we had glass concepts with a glass bottle with a uh, plastic insert already in it. It would go in, the nozzle would go through the plastic insert, fill the bottle, be uh, withdrawn, and it would carry on on the same capping line and be capped. So those were solutions at position one, where the bottles came in with the insert in it and then is filled. Position two is the one where is the bottles are diverted onto a different insertion point. And then we had one, which is number three, where we have the plastic insert integrated into the cap. So maybe we can mount the plastic inserts in the cap. The bottles carry on exactly the same process. We have no changes to the production line. And as the cap engages, it inserts the insert. It's then tightened on, and when the user untightens it, the plastic insert will be inside the bottle. So really around the challenges of trying to have minimal changes to the production facilities, we found three, other, three areas where we could be slightly creative and provide different solutions. So this flexible star one was, um, we used a, a slightly different material to allow the nozzle, the filling nozzle to pass through this star point here. So though these lips were very flexible, uh, the nozzle could go through it, fill up and withdraw out of it. And then the user would just pour the product through this aperture here. Again, using uh, this headspace here to have a non-drip lip. Then we went slightly more, um, more creative and a bit more complex and decided we could have a plastic lip which sits inside the cap. And that plastic lip could hold uh, a spout and uh, the insert. So this could all be inside the cap this time. When the bottle comes, it could engage it. So this is what it looks like. That sat inside the cap, so is this and this. And then on engagement, it puts the plastic part and the metal part inside the bottle. Then trying to simplify it into two parts, this one we have a plastic insert with some small bridges which holds the insert inside the cap. So that's two pieces now. And then going down to one piece, this is with a single molding, slightly more complex, uh, with a sort of castle on top of the insert. So the idea with this one is the inserts um, are below, the cap comes on over the top, breaks the uh, breaks these little bridges, which means this castle sits inside uh, the cap and then holds in place the insert. So that's all inside the cap and then it engages it into the bottle during the filling process. And then a final one, actually it's not the final, I think there's one more, um, is a slightly more simple um, molding which has these, these arms. And as you press the cap down onto it, the arms flick down and help hold it in place on the, the threaded lip. So this uh, insert is inside the cap. Then on the capping line, the bottle goes up into place, pushes the arms up, and the arms hold it inside the bottle. So when you take the cap off, uh, the insert is in place. And then the final one, the one which we actually went for, was one where the cap was engaged onto this insert, but the insert goes outside of the bottle. This gave us even more head space, and you could see the plastic insert from the outside. Then the plastic insert engages onto the thread of the bottle. So it looks a little bit like this when it's on the shelf, um, and looks a little bit like this when the lid's off. So basically we come up with these concepts and then we put them into a selection matrix. We had a few more concepts, but at the stage gate meeting, uh, we have to narrow this down to two or three concepts which we want to take forward to further development. Uh, so we take all the criteria from the musts and desirables. Some of these, some of the musts, all the products, um, all the designs fulfill. 
so we can get rid of those from the list. And we just concentrate on the musts and desirables uh, in which the, the designs are differentiated by. And when we finalized that, we decided um, this plastic rim case was uh, probably going to be the most successful because it hit these three elements on the integrated product development process. Firstly, it creates market differentiation because while it sat on the shelf, you can see that it has this drizzle function. From the outside, you can see that there is a plastic rim differentiating it from the other products. It has a larger lip and a non-drip spout so that it has product level uh, improvements on the original designs and the other concepts. And it doesn't require any changes to the production facilities. So it was the best in terms of the production uh, level of IPD. And that's essentially the end of the case. Um, would you like to ask any questions about the case first? Okay. So in the per first section, we looked at where the value resided. And we had these two cases for the orange squeezer and said, in this particular case, all the uh, value is at the market level. And that's where you can make big uh, design differentiation. In our case, uh, quicker and easier production. Um, hang on, what's this? This one was quicker and easier to produce, but it has slightly less functionality uh, than this product um, and had slightly less market differentiation. But the way we separated it was the most value resided in keeping the production systems the same. So any changes to the production systems would be uh, big value lost. And anything we could produce which could be integrated into their production lines uh, was was where the primary value lay. So we thought this was the one to concentrate on. And therefore we'd say that in this particular case, this type of product was better than this one. So you've got a chance for some questions, otherwise we'll take a 15 minute break. Get out of the back. Um, I didn't realize before doing this project, but there's quite a science on these non-drip lips. And there's a certain angle if, basically if. If this angle of return or creep is over a certain amount, it produces a non-drip status. Now, if you have different viscosities, that angle has to increase more. But I was amazed when we did some prototyping, some rudimentary testing, how much of an improvement that makes over just the basic uh, bottle. Um, having this uh, steep upslope means that the drip cannot follow it round and it just falls straight off. Um, so it made big, big improvements over this standard bottle. Was that your question just? Yeah. Um, not, not quite as good in the sense that you, it doesn't have a projection in which you can uh, direct the drizzling more. But in terms of cleanliness, it was, it was pretty much as good because this, this non-drip spout was, was well performing. Um, so I would say it was good. And not only that, but you didn't have the, uh, uh, the spring mechanism to deal with either. Um, so in many respects, it was a little bit better. Go ahead. Uh, well, you can, you can find these plastic inserts. Um, I'll, have a look, I'll have a look out for these. Um, this was done in 2009. Um, so it may not be in Danish markets yet. But uh, I'll have a look and I'll try to bring one, one along next week. I'll contact Crown Packaging and see where they are at the moment. Uh, but you can get them. I, I know you have them here in the... Um, in balsamic vinegars, soy sauce, things like that, and, and oils. Did you just do the calculations of the angles, or did you make prototypes of the distance? Um, we calculated the angles, and then you produce prototypes. 
Um, there is, as I said, there is a science behind it. So they, they produce non-drip uh, caps in this place um, and they know how to produce these, but it varies on viscosity. And not only that, when you're using salad dressings, it has particles in. So then you have to start doing some prototyping to say, okay, here's roughly where we think the angle needs to be. Let's do some prototyping now to test whether that's, that's quite correct. But these were all produced by SLA models. So you can do that from simple, rapid prototyping, 3D printing technology now. Any other questions? Okay, we'll take a, uh, a 15 minute break now. And if we come back just after a quarter past, we'll go into the next lecture.